Jason is, I forget the name, Experience Reality Virtually about the future of travel. Um, and we have with us um, Megan and Mark from Sabre. Just want to say a quick thank you to Chase, Downtown Dallas, Vela Wood, Touch Titans, Dev Mountain, Cirrus, Kratos, and many more. And um, a special thanks to the building for um, providing the space for the session. So, um, and please use share on social media if you want to. The hashtag is DSW16. And with that, I'll give you Mark and Megan. Yeah, we can clap. It's not too early to clap, I don't think. There's so many cables up here. Oh, my. <laughs> Sorry if we look clustered. Uh, so we work at Sabre, and Sabre's uh, headquartered out in South Lake. So we're just in South Oklahoma, kind of. Uh, so our commute in this morning was kind of different for both of us. Um, as, as we were introduced, I'm Mark McSp McSpadden. And I'm Megan Snee. And we work... Uh, at Sabre. Sabre is a large travel technology company. We actually built the first electronic reservation system in the world back in the day as part of American Airlines. We spun off of American many years ago now. We provide travel technology for agencies, corporations, for airlines to run their operations and for hotels to run their operations as well. So I like to say that if you've been on a plane or stayed in a hotel or gone on any kind of corporate travel or business trip, you probably used our systems and didn't even know it. Now, they don't let us touch any of that really important stuff. Uh, we work in the lab. Uh, so Megan's a developer in the lab, I lead the lab, and we are tasked with looking at capabilities that will impact travel over the next decade. So we're looking at things like, how does 3D printing impact travel? How does message-based interfaces inter impact travel? And of course, we're looking at how does virtual reality impact travel. I can't see the slides from here. Oh, so we're going to talk about virtual reality today. I know that's what we're going to talk about. But we're, the way we're going to go about it is we're going to start by talking just level set on virtual reality as it is today. Uh, Megan's going to do a lot of that, talking about a lot of the devices that are out, a lot of the uh, content, and a lot of the content creation, how that goes about. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the travel use cases that we're seeing actually in the, in the wild today. And then we'll talk about what's around the corner as well as answer any questions you may have. So I hope you came interested in virtual reality and the impact it has on travel as part of Dallas Startup Week. I'm sure you're thinking about how can my startup or my future startup uh, start utilizing this technology. And hopefully we can uh, talk a little bit about that. We also have... Uh, some gear here with us. So if you haven't had the opportunity to experience some of this virtual reality in person, uh, we'll either have some time either right at the end of the session or we've been told we can spill out into the hallway and do some virtual reality amongst all the other people and make them really jealous. So that's what we're going to do today. I hope you're ready for it. We're going to get started by uh, just talking about what is virtual reality. So virtual reality is the use of computer technology to create a simulated environment. I love this definition because it really hones in on, unlike traditional user interfaces, VR places the user inside the experience. Um, instead of viewing the screen in front of them, the users are immersed and able to interact with the 3D world. This immersion word is one that you'll hear over and over and over again throughout this presentation, throughout the talk of virtual reality. It really is that experience of fully being uh, in a place that you're not physically at. So that's what we see with virtual reality. Now, we're going to contrast that a little bit, and I'm going to say way up front, I don't see virtual reality replacing travel of any kind. A lot of times you hear about this from a travel sector, you're like, oh, well, instead of going to this location, I'll just put on my VR headset, I'll be there virtually, and that'll be good enough. Uh, we don't think that's good enough. We think that's never been good enough to have a simulated experience of a place has never replaced going to the place. And so what we, we find is that it's not something that replaces travel, but we think it's a really interesting channel in the inspirational phase of travel, so deciding where to go. I had a gentleman tell me out in San Francisco a month ago uh, they were going to look at the Northern Lights. They wanted to go look at the Northern Lights. Well, there's a handful of destinations they could pick 
to go to to view the Northern Lights. And he was interested in using virtual reality to experience some of those places before he went to help him decide which location he was actually gonna go to. We also see it as an interesting channel, kind of post-booking, pre-trip. So I know that I'm going to go to this location. Please help me learn more about it. Orient me to the space. I've got, I've got uh, three young daughters. Uh, before the third one came, we went to Disney World. I would have given, I would have paid, right, to have an hour virtually in the Magic Kingdom to know my way around that place so that I knew which candy places to avoid, which princesses to go see, all of the things that I learned on my first day and took one sixth of my vacation to figure out, I would have used uh, in, in a virtual environment. I would have done things like made reservations. I would have loved to have a guide virtually there with me to help me make those reservations along the way. And I would have experienced the trip better having done it virtually first. And so that's what we're starting to think about when we think of virtual reality uh, as it plays in travel. I wanna set that stage up front of, of where we're thinking and where we're seeing uh, also other travel companies play in the space. But before we get too much further down that road, I wanna let Megan set the stage for uh, what is uh, what are the devices on the market today? Oh no, I've still got some more slides. <laughs> I'm still gonna talk about Oculus, like how we got here, which is uh, Oculus in 2012 raises a, an amount of money on Kickstarter that starts them on the path to building their Oculus VR headset. Um, what's really interesting about this is they have perfected pretty close the head tracking technology. The thing that used to make people sick about virtual reality was when you moved your head, the screen couldn't track fast enough with you, and so you'd get sick really fast. Um, this has gotten really good, even from the developmental units that we've had in the past. The Oculus DK2, uh, we used to make people sit down to use uh, because we could knock you over pretty easily. We could tell you, hey, look down here and then look up and you'd fall over. Like, legitimately, you just fall over into our arms. Um, with the Samsung headsets that are out now that are par partnered with Oculus, you can stand up. As long as you don't get crazy motion sick, you can put these on, start looking around, no problem. So that's where the, the technology has really, really gotten us to. And when, uh, when Chris Dixon saw this, uh, saw the Oculus headset, uh, who's a partner, Andreessen Horowitz, big VC firm, says, I think I've seen five or six demos in my life that make me think the world was about to change. The Apple II, Netscape, Google, iPhone, Oculus. Like it's that kind of game-changing technology. Um, so Oculus, uh, 2012 starts making their headsets, uh, mostly in small little development units, then gets bought by Facebook for $2 billion. Uh, this puts the company that wants to connect everyone in the world, owning the most advanced VR technology in the world. On that, I think uh, yesterday I saw Facebook's 10-year roadmap that they projected. In five years, it was all about the messaging platforms. Out in 10 years, it was all about the Oculus platform, about virtual reality. Even Zuckerberg says virtual reality was once the dream of science fiction, but the internet was also once a dream, so were computers and smartphones. The future is coming, and we have a chance to build it together. So not only Oculus and VR as an experience, but as a platform to build on top of. So that's just a, a quick introduction to like what we, what we see virtual reality, how we got to hear the kind of recent history we didn't go super far back into really early VR, uh, but hopefully it orients you to the space. And now Megan's gonna tell you about uh, the devices that are out uh, today, that are being pre-ordered today, uh, the content and the content distribution. We are a little bit behind on the slides oh, <laughs> over yeah. here. Well, you keep hitting <laughs> and I think that that's doing something, but it's not. The iPad and the Mac are not connected. Not connected. <laughs> so, uh, First, we have the Oculus Rift, um, which the pre-orders have been opened uh, actually about two, two months ago uh, now. Uh, we ordered a pre, uh, an Oculus Rift within the first 20 minutes that the, uh, the pre-order window opened, and now we are uh, being told we won't get it until the end of May or beginning of June because of a component shortage, and even the orders that are being placed today won't ship until at least July. Uh, so the Oculus is really popular. It's on the top of the market. Um, 
it's currently controlled with an Xbox controller, but they are releasing what's called Oculus Touch controllers, uh, which I'll touch on in a little bit. Uh, the base price is $600, and that includes a headset, built-in headphones, uh, a motion tracking sensor, an Oculus remote, uh, cables, all the cables you need, uh, the Oculus One controller, and a game called Lucky's Tail. Get my slide. <laughs> we'll, we'll get this by the end of the session. Um, Oculus does require a pretty heavy duty PC uh, or a gaming PC. Uh, the ones you see up on the slide here are actually package um, price. Uh, they, are, they start at $999 with the purchase of a Rift. It does not come with it, um, but they are some pretty, uh, pretty good quality computers if you uh, consider investing in VR. So that's a uh, thousand bucks for the computer, six hundred bucks for the headset. Uh, so next we have the HTC Vive, which is probably Rift's biggest competition. Uh, it is uh, made by HTC and Valve, and it has uh, 360 degree motion tracking, which offers realistic uh, room scale experiences. And to do that, the headset has 32 headset sensors, uh, which help with uh, motion tracking in your head and uh, a front-facing camera, which actually allows you to see through to the real world, which the Oculus does not have. Uh, and if you have ever tried a virtual reality headset, the see-through or pass-through camera is so handy, even just to check the time on your phone or your watch. Um, so the pre-orders are open on HTC Vive, and they start shipping in May. Uh, it is $800 compared to the $600 price tag on Oculus. Uh, but the pre-order uh, offer currently open includes the headset, two wireless controllers, uh, the two base stations for 360 room scale motion tracking, and three games, Job Simulator, Fantastic Contraption, and Tilt Brush by Google. HTC Vive also requires a pretty heavy duty computer. Uh, these two on the screen are uh, advertised by HTC. Uh, the HP starts at about 1000 and the Alienware goes up to almost $2,000, but that may seem like a lot, especially included uh, in the full price of the headset as well, but better specs equals smoother content equals a better experience for you. And the Alienware one looks cooler. <laughs> uh, these are some of the Vive accessories. This is one of two of the wireless controllers on the left, and the base stations are on the right. Uh, the wireless controllers have 24 sensors in each uh, in each head, sorry in each controller uh, for enhanced mo motion contract mo contraction motion tracking. Uh, it also has a circular trackpad and a dual stage triggers for interaction. Um, uh, within your apps and demos. Uh, the base stations on the right sync with your system wirelessly, but they are required to be very close to an outlet. They're not powered wirelessly, uh, and they must be placed in a high area above your, uh, your play area, so they look down basically at you to be able to track your movement in the room. Uh, we did have a short video, but we're told there's no audio. Um, can we try to play it? Try it. Try it. Wait, let's, I think you have to go click it though. All right. <laughs> Thank you. It does at least show how they work, so maybe audio won't be an issue. There's a little bit coming out of my laptop. <laughs> So you can see he's got the controllers, one in each hand, and the headset on his head. Um, he does talk a little bit ex uh, about this, the technology in the Vive and how they're used specifically. Um, I did find these videos on YouTube, <laughs> and we'll have our slides posted uh, somewhere um, today. And if you're interested in actually hearing the audio on this, we'll... Uh, We'll get those to you. So here, I think he's playing the job simulator. Um, he's got basically two Mickey Mouse hands inside uh, the game. And using the triggers on the controllers, he can pick up objects and throw them uh, inside the, the demo. 
Uh, notice he is standing up to the HTC Vive should be uh, pretty, pretty good about uh, not triggering motion sickness or VR sickness. They're the base stations. They have theirs mounted actually up on walls. Uh, I have seen images of people placing them high up on bookshelves if you don't want to drill into your walls. <laughs> and I think he's just about wrapped up there. So uh, that was a little bit on the Vive, but next we have the PlayStation VR. Uh, which is definitely game-centered, as it is uh, targeting current PS4 customers. Um, it will be available October 2016 of this year, uh, and pre-orders are open. The base price for the headset alone is $400, uh, but they do have a launch bundle out currently for $500, which includes the headset, a PlayStation camera, two Move controllers, the PlayStation uh, VR Worlds game, which combines five VR experiences into one game, and Playroom VR, uh, which is playable by up to five local players, one wearing the headset and four using uh, r normal PS4 controllers, uh, and they can interact with in-game objects. And uh, both of those games seem to be a series of mini games, but uh, they do look like pretty awesome experiences. Uh, but PlayStation has also secured Star Wars Battlefront exclusively uh, and other titles like Final Fantasy XIV and Gran Turismo Sport. So those will both be pretty interesting games uh, once the headset is released. Uh, these are the PlayStation Move controllers. Uh, they've been available since PlayStation 3, uh, but they continue to be supported uh, through PS4 and especially in the virtual reality uh, corner of their games. Um, they work, with, they have action buttons, just like the normal controllers, uh, but they also track movements of your hands, and the spheres on top actually change colors as you play uh, to provide feedback to you. One more thing on the, the PlayStation. When we talked to some of the folks from Samsung that were looking at uh, doing their VR stuff, uh, they're really looking at the, the, the PlayStation VR as a signal to adoption of virtual reality in the home because you do, most of the people will already have the console, so it's really just the purchase of the VR headset. They're really looking to see how many of those get purchased to see what the demand is for virtual reality uh, without having to go get another dedicated PC. So uh, separate headsets might be at the top of the VR game right now, but there's also options like cardboard, uh, which is powered by a phone. And uh, smartphone-powered VR uh, really brings VR available to anyone who has uh, a compatible smartphone, which is most people in the US these days. Uh, so a cardboard runs from about $10 to $25 uh, each. Uh, or you can DIY. Uh, Google released the specs at Google I.O. 2014. Um, and smartphone only does have its limitations because you have to secure your phone inside something like a cardboard and hold it up to your face. Um, some of the cardboards do have a trigger. Uh, I'm trying to do this. I need another hand today. Um, but some of them have a trigger that um, pushes a section of the, ins uh, of the cardboard inside to your smartphone screen, uh, which acts as a tap. So you can still interact with some of the demos, and they're not just straight up video or photo. Uh, let's see. Go ahead to the next one. Um, so Viewmaster is another option. And we actually prefer this over cardboard because uh, it supports nearly every smartphone out there uh, that has access to the iOS App Store or the Google Play Store. Uh, and it runs at $30 originally, but it's currently $18 on sale on Amazon Prime, um, which is great. And that's even less than some of the cardboards that we've paid for. Uh, but what's cool about this is that they come with those little reels, um, which you see right in the middle. Um, those come in experience packs separately, which run uh, about 10 to $15 each. But you can go places, virtually, of course, uh, to London, the Amazon, and even outer space. And I actually saw an underwater one advertised yesterday, too, which looks pretty cool. Uh, I think that's all we've got on that one. Now, Samsung is the big player uh, of the smartphone uh, game. Um, the Gear VR is powered by Oculus technology. 
Uh, it's a higher fidelity version of cardboard, um, but it's similar, obviously, as it runs off a phone. But it does require a Samsung phone, particularly uh, the Galaxy S7, S7 Edge, Note 5, Galaxy S6, or S6 Edge. Uh, and the headset itself runs at $99, but each of those phones at full price runs from $600 to $800. Uh, so they're at full price. They, the full price of the Gear VR plus the phone that you need to run it uh, is almost more expensive than an Oculus, um, but you don't need that p powerful PC to run it. Um, so unlike the cardboard in the Viewmaster, though, the gear has head straps, uh, which frees up your hands. Uh, it also has a touchpad on the side, a back button, uh, volume buttons, and a focus wheel, which allows you to adjust the display to your vision. Uh, and we have these with us, uh, both the Viewmaster and some gears, if you'd like to try them out. Uh, Samsung did put a lot of muscle into their latest campaigns, and that included a uh, Sam, or, sorry, a Super Bowl commercial for the Gear VR, uh, as well as a promo for a free Gear VR with the pre-order of a S7 or an S7 Edge, and a series of commercials for the Galaxy S7 and S7 Edge featuring Little Wayne. Um, we do have one of those, but unfortunately the audio is out. Uh, yeah, and Little Wayne without the audio it just almost isn't worth it. Uh, does anyone have one of these headsets? Does anyone get one of these in the S7 pre-order? Okay, cool. Interesting. Uh, oof. Maybe. Do you want to try usually, it? Let's try it. That's some feedback issues. We'll try. We're going to be outside the video, too. You're going totally off the reservation. <laughs> I'm going to take my water bottle with me. I think the audio is coming out of the projector, but there would be some major feedback issues if I tried to put the mic up to it. Um, basically, Lil Wayne asks what Wesley Snipe, or Wesley Snipes says, hey, isn't this cool, Lil Wayne? And Lil Wayne's like, I uh, can't talk right now. I'm delivering a baby elephant. <laughs> um, so there are, I think now, three uh, virtual reality commercials with Lil Wayne, and it cracks me up every time I see one. Uh, they're available on YouTube if you'd like to check them out <laughs> at a later time. Um, so this was some of the available tech, but what about content? That's obviously a big part of VR. Uh, content's really in two baskets. Uh, digitally created content, uh, like the Jurassic World demo, uh, and uh, real world capture as photo and video, like the Cirque du Soleil uh, Zarkana demo. And uh, we think uh, the second option, real-world capture, will have the biggest impact on travel, so that's where we're going to focus right now. <clears throat> uh, so the trick is that we need travel content, uh, and Samsung is actually uh, starving for non-gaming content. Uh, that's what they had told Mark, but when we got a uh, an estimate, sorry, for um, three minutes of VR video content, it is uh, six figures. Um, so that's really expensive right now. Uh, and the best options are really to just do it yourself unless you want to spend and really, really invest uh, in your VR content. Um, so the price of that will come down eventually. Um, you've probably heard of some of the Go GoPro rigs uh, as, as well as maybe some um, handheld cameras that have been advertised recently. Yeah, right now, basically, people that are creating VR capture content, they're movie studios. And so you're paying movie studio prices because they're really good at it, and they're good at capturing this kind of video. Uh, so first, we have the GoPro Odyssey. Um, <laughs> the punchline here is that it cost $15,000. Uh, it does include 16 GoPro Hero 4 cameras uh, and the coordinating array backpacks and micro SD cards for those, uh, as well as the, cam the panoramic capture rig itself and a Pelican carrying case. Uh, the cameras alone make up half the price, uh, but it's a limited access program, which is probably why it costs so much. Uh, and it's, it's limited production and only available to very qualified applicants. We are not qualified enough. I've tried to give them our money and they will not take it. 
Um, so this is a Freedom 360 mount. They do have several options. Uh, this is just one of probably about four different ones uh, that they have available now. They uh, house multiple GoPro cameras. This one in particular, I believe, has six. And uh, they range in price from $500 to $1,500, depending on the mount that you choose, as well as if you want to include the software that goes along with it. Uh, and it does not include the price of your GoPro cameras in there. So you would have to purchase those separately as well. Um, on the other hand, if you happen to have a 3D printer lying around, there are plenty of specs available to print your own rigs. Yeah, the, the trick there is the software to stitch it together. Um, you're still going to have to use some kind of software to, to take all these six or eight or however many different video sources and put them together into an environment that you can explore. Uh, this is the Ricoh Theta S. Uh, it's $350. Dollars <laughs> cameras. Um, it's a handheld camera. It's only about five inches. There's uh, two fisheye lenses, one on each side, uh, and it captures high-res stills and full HD video. Uh, it uh, it works in conjunction with the smartphone app uh, and actually includes live streaming now uh, and an option called Live View, where you can uh, basically watch your video on your smartphone uh, while the camera is in another place. It, either in the room or while someone else is holding it. <coughs> this one is the Iris 360. Sorry, iPad one hand is not fun. <laughs> there we go. Um, so the Iris 360 runs at $2,000. Um, if you can see, it does have Google Street View branded on the front of it. Uh, Google Street View is a supporter of Iris 360 as well as the Ricoh Theta. Those are the two cameras that they recommend if you're wanting to contribute uh, to the still images of Street View. Uh, this one is compact but at six inches, but it's still two and a half pounds, so it's not quite uh, travel friendly. <laughs> um, it's easy to use and controlled by any Wi-Fi enabled smartphone like the, like the Ricoh. Uh, and the, the cool thing about this one is that the onboard tech analyzes your capture at, as it's going uh, and stitches it together, um, and it produces an image ready for sharing. But the downside there is that it is only an image, although a very high quality one. No video on that one. Um, so this is a 360 fly. It's an exclusive at Best Buy right now and runs at $400. It's about a two and a half inch uh, sphere, uh, and it has the one fisheye lens on top. Uh, we do have this. Do we have it today with I us? I think we do. It's in the backpack. Uh, so if you'd like to check it out, uh, we do have it with us today as well. Uh, it does take stills and video, and again works in coordination with a smartphone or tablet app. Uh, it's actually waterproof down to, two, uh, down to 120 feet, and it's considered the world's widest single-lens field-of-view camera. Um, and uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, it also gives you the option to post directly to Facebook now, too. Uh, and Mark, did you try I've that? I've tried this. Uh, the idea that you're going to go pick up a 360 camera and just post it isn't exactly valid yet. Uh, I had. To, the meta tags weren't right on the file. Facebook didn't know it was a 360 video. YouTube didn't know it was 360 video. We had to change some things about it. And even then, navigating a 360 video right now, even in some of the headsets and on the phone, isn't great. So consuming that content is even a little bit iffy today. Uh, so that was some of the cameras available for uh, our 360 video capture. Um, now we'll look a little bit at distribution. So how do we get the content to our devices and how is it provided to us? Okay. Um, so first, providing content. Um, how are people currently doing it? And that's raw photo and video upload uh, straight to sources like Google Street View and YouTube 360 video. Uh, and we did mention uh, Facebook 360, but that is not really considered VR right now as it doesn't even support cardboard. Um, and YouTube 360 has cardboard support, but only on Android. So we're waiting patiently for that to come to iOS. Uh, and then there's app submissions, um, which if you happen to create your own content, uh, you can su submit directly to iOS App Store or the Google Play Store, uh, or 
if you're more on the gaming side or full development of VR, you can submit it to something like Oculus Share, uh, which is a platform for makers to share with other makers or anyone who has an Oculus headset wanting to try out content. Uh, and then, of course, professional content. Uh, makers like Jaunt VR and Verse uh, make and produce 360 video, very high quality. Uh, some, they're some of the greatest demos that we've tried. Uh, and then, of course, game companies who are submitting to uh, places like PlayStation and uh, Valve for, or Steam for the HTC Vive. Uh, so first, uh, console-powered content. Uh, I split this out into two sections, console and phone-powered. Uh, first, we have the Oculus Rift, which is currently Oculus Share. Um, and HTC Vive, uh, in conjunction with Valve, runs through Steam VR, which is a very uh, common gaming platform uh, already. And that probably means that they'll have a great library of VR uh, games uh, coming eventually. They've hinted at Portal, which is one of my favorite games, uh, and I would love to see that and try it out in VR. Uh, and then, of course, PlayStation VR uh, with the virtual PlayStation Store. And um, in retail spaces like GameStop and Amazon, because PlayStation does still support disc games. Uh, and then on the phone-powered side, with the Gear VR, there's uh, the Oculus Store, which is different than Oculus Share. Uh, it's actually inside. Uh, it's a virtual app store, basically, for the Gear VR. And uh, for Cardboard or Viewmaster, basically any other smartphone, uh, you can find content on the Google Play Store, the iOS App Store, uh, and specifically with Viewmaster, uh, the retail spaces for the experience pack you can find on Amazon, uh, Target, and Walmart. Um, and then again, YouTube 360 video, uh, which VR is supported on Android. And even Netflix has a virtual living room where you can sit on a couch, on your couch, watching Netflix. <laughs> so that's the lay of the land where, where VR is today, kind of technically, device-wise, content-wise, distribution-wise. Uh, where are we seeing it in travel specifically? We're actually seeing a few companies adopt this. Uh, Forward-looking companies, Qantas, an airline out of Australia, has uh, offered it as an entertainment option to some of their first-class passengers. They make first class as nice as they can, but sometimes you still want to escape that. And so they provide this uh, to on a few of their routes as an option to watch mostly videos and movies in a more immersive way. Uh, there's an agency out of the UK named Thomas Cook that has actually used this in their brick and mortar agencies to upsell seats. Basically what they do is they put the VR headset on and you see an economy seat kind of right here in front of you, and then they show you what Economy Plus looks like, which is an extra six inches for $50. And they can even show you a, a business class cabin if you say, oh, well, you're in Economy Plus, this is what the business class cabin looks like on this flight. Uh, they saw a small uptake in uh, conversion by doing that. Uh, it was a very small trial, very small uptake, but still interesting enough uh, for their chief innovation officer at the time said their use of VR was to further enhance the in-store shopping experience, uh, allowing them to make informed decisions regarding their next holiday. Again, this idea of not replacing travel, but a channel in this uh, inspiration or right uh, pre-booking or post-booking pre-travel phase. Marriott is the travel company that's actually invested the most in this space. Last year they had these, they called it the uh, 4D experience. Um, so they made these pods that you step into and you put on an Oculus headset, you put on headphones, and they show you this beach scene, and they also pump in warm air and mist into this pod while you're standing there so you can experience the whole, kind of more than just virtually experience the place they're showing you. They actually took these to several hotels, including here in Dallas, um, further enhancing that feeling that, hey, we're not replacing travel. We're actually, you're on a trip, we're gonna show you a different trip. We actually find that people are, are very open to travel while they're traveling. Um, they, they like the idea of it, and so it can be a really inspirational stage. Again, towards the content creation, uh, the company that built the beach scene for them was the movie studio that created Gravity. Um, so if, if you get the idea of what that, where we are in content creation right now. They've also been offering uh, Samsung Gear checkouts for, uh, there's a hotel, one of their hotels in New York and London, so that you can check out a gear from the front desk, 
take it back to your room and experience a virtual postcard of the area around the hotel. So again, connecting travelers to where they are in, a, in an interesting way. And on the content side, a company that we've come across called UVisit, which is uh, creating this, this destination content, trying to aggregate it so that people can actually do these types of experiences. We're, we're, we talk to a lot of hotels that are having a hard time trying to figure out, hey, how do I, I'm not, I don't have the expertise to create this content. I need somebody to do it for me, and then I need someone to distribute it. Uh, UVisit kind of fits in that space, and we're excited to see how that evolves. Uh, in my mind, the innovation in this space over the next three years is all about content creation and distribution. It's less on the tech side. It's, it's really good on the tech side, and so that content has to catch up. So we've got five minutes, three minutes uh, for a few questions. Um, we're going to hold the what's next. I can tell you there's some cool cameras coming out. Let's see. Megan said the Gear 360 is coming out. When? spring of this year, but there's really no telling when spring actually is, because spring goes through July. <laughs> it's like, uh, but the promise here is that it'll fit well, well with the Gear VR, so you could have like a whole seamless experience. That's the promise. Uh, the handsets on the Oculus, these are really cool for motion stuff. Uh, we had a video on that. Um, there's some stuff on uh, kind of treadmills. How do I move around in virtual space? like actually physically walk and have these things happen to me. Um, this one's pre-ordered now for what? 700. $700. Um, there's another one here that's omnidirectional that doesn't have a price or a date on it, so it's probably not real, uh, but still <laughs> looks cool. If, hey, how do, if I want to move around in a virtual space, how do we do that? And on the travel side specifically, it's, it's going to be how do I interact with these videos that you're showing me. Right now it's very video based, like I can explore space and I can kind of move through it. But even like the Thomas Cook example, if I want to make the upgrade, I take off the VR headset and I talk to a person right there and I say, yeah, I want this seat versus this seat. Uh, the future of travel, how do I enable reservations, purchases, interactions, dialogue through these virtual environments so that I create a more inspirational space? I can create some, some I can lay the groundwork for better experiences once you arrive. So questions? Yes. Yeah, we've seen uh, the NBA be pretty progressive in VR in sports. Uh, they've actually live streamed a 360 view of a game. Um, Again, testing out the limits of what are bandwidth requirements, all these technical things. Um, I think that, you, yeah, you'll get there. It'll be a question, there'll be a question of replay versus live stream. I think that you'll always come to. There are some games that I've watched uh, that I would definitely watch again in VR. Um, go back and watch them, even though I know the outcome, because they were so cool. Uh, the other side, on the event side, even planning events, we're seeing an interesting space for VR is that a lot goes into uh, making site visits and going to hotels and viewing their space kind of blindly, going into that having experienced it a little bit in VR could be a really interesting change in that dynamic. Yes. Uh, yeah, is it a fad like 3D TV? That's a really good example. I think there's some interesting things that I think we're learning from 3D TV. I think when you look at what PlayStation's doing on some of their gaming to make it interactive for people not only wearing the VR headset but everyone else around, I think we're starting to, to say, does how do I make this a good experience for the one individual? How do I make it an inclusive experience for everyone else around you? Are the next questions. Because the idea that I can load my avatar into a VR environment and it mimic me, like I've seen an academic rig that has a camera that points back at your face so that your reflection in VR reflects what you're doing in live space, but that stuff's, that stuff's pretty far off. So this kind of full virtual environment, I think um, maybe way, way down the line. I, I think there's a good chance though you, the same way that when you're looking at pictures, man, when, when my family goes into travel planning mode, 
right? There are pictures everywhere, there are tabs open everywhere. I can see that being a VR experience, that I'm just gonna load this up and this is how I'm gonna do that thing. And then I can either make reservations there or if not, I get out of it and do the other things that I'm gonna do. So I think there'll be some experiences that it does lend itself to. Okay, what we're gonna do for the space is to make sure we free the space up. We're gonna go out here. If you haven't tried these VR headsets on, we've got two of the Samsungs. Uh, we've got uh, one of the Viewmasters. And so I hope you stick around and can do that with us. <laughs> 